to The Catholic View, a program about Catholics for everyone. And now, presenting The Catholic View is Father Patrick J. O'Doherty of the Queen of Peace Catholic Church in Ocala. Welcome to The Catholic View. I'm Father Patrick J. O'Doherty, and like all Christians, I'm a recovering sinner. I am also the pastor of Queen of Peace Catholic Church on State Road 200. That's in Ocala, Florida, in the United States of America, in the Western Hemisphere, in the world, in the universe, and in the mind of God. Today we're going to look at images of God. What does God look like? All kinds of men and women say, oh, I believe in God. The scripture, the word of God says, even the devil believes in God and trembles at the thought. So all the believers in the whole world have something in common with the devil. They believe in God. So what does he look like? I heard a story one time, a lovely story about a grandfather who was babysitting his six-year-old grandson and the child was wearing him out. At the end of the day, the grandfather puts the little boy in bed. They say prayers together. He kisses him goodnight. And the grandfather goes out and he collapses in a lazy boy chair and saying to himself, thank God almighty, I'm worn out. But within a couple of seconds, the young boy says, grandpa, grandpa. And impatient and annoyed, the grandfather says, what? He says, what, what, what? And he says, Grandpa, I'm lonely. I'm lonely. Well, using religion to get rid of the little boy, he said, you don't have to be lonely. He said, he said God is with you. And the little boy said, I know that, he says, but I want somebody here with skin on. Now, lovely story from a child. And in a way, that taught me a lot about who God is. Um, God, Jesus is God with skin on. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus Christ. An example. One day, one of the apostles of Jesus uh, said to him, Philip it was, said to him, show us the Father. And Jesus said to him, how long do I have to be with you? Whoever sees me sees the Father. Now that's astounding if you think about it long enough. Whoever sees me sees the Father. Going back for a moment to the home in rural Ireland, it was very easy as I was growing up as a child because here was the picture of Jesus looking at me every day of my life. And I'm hearing, whoever sees me sees the Father. This is what God looks like. But then, look at this. They led him out to the place of the skull, and there they crucified him. This is what God looks like. A God who loves us. A God who died for our sins. I have here an extraordinary story um, it's coming out of World War II and the Nazi concentration camps. The SS, I, I presume that was some type of secret service or something that was conducting these concentration camps. But it says the SS seemed preoccupied, more preoccupied than usual, more disturbed than usual to hang a young boy in front of thousands of spectators was no light matter. The head of the camp read the verdict. All eyes were on the child. He was lividly pale, almost calm, biting his lips. The gallows threw its shadow over him. The three victims mounted together onto the chairs. The three necks were placed at the same moment within the nooses. Long live liberty, 
cried the two adults, but the child was silent. Where is God? Where is he? Someone, someone behind me asked. At a sign from the head of the camp, the three chairs tipped over. Total silence throughout the camp. On the horizon, the sun was setting. Bear your heads, yelled the head of the camp. His voice was raucous. We were weeping. Cover your heads. Then the march past began. The two adults were no longer alive. Their tongues hung swollen, blue-tinged. But the third rope was still moving. Being so light, the child was still alive. For more than half an hour, he stayed there, struggling between life and death, dying in slow agony under our eyes. And we had to look at him full in the face. He was still alive when I passed in front of him. His tongue was still red, his eyes not yet glazed. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, where is God now? And I heard a voice within me answer him, where is he? He is here. He is hanging on this gallows. Do you see what I mean? This is what God looks like. A God who cried out on Calvary, I thirst. And he was thirsting for you and me. There are four gospel writers, four men who wrote the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 300 years ago, there was a, a little nighttime prayer, and it says, and now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. There are four corners to my bed. There are four angels overhead, one to watch, one to pray, two to lead my soul away. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, bless the bed that I lay on. Growing up, when my mother used to say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, bless the bed that I lay on, I had no clue who they were. But it was a lovely idea. Now I realize that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are four gospel writers. They've written for us the story of Jesus. Luke, in particular, shows us a very compassionate Jesus. He tells us the following. One day Jesus was sitting around with riffraff, with sinners, and standing in the background were people like me, the priests of the temple, and they were, they were looking down their noses at Jesus, and they were saying, if this man is from God, he'd know what kind of people these are that he's sitting with, that they're sinners. And Jesus, in answer to their thoughts, said to them, look, he said, sick people need a doctor. I have come, he said, not for the self-righteous, but for sinners. And then he tells us a remarkable story about what his father is like. He says, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, and he loses one of them. Will he not leave the 99 in the desert in a safe place and go in search of the lost sheep? And when he finds it, he puts it on his shoulders and carries it home rejoicing. He calls in all his friends and neighbors, and he says, come rejoice with me, for I have found the sheep that was lost. In the same way I tell you, there is more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner than over 99 righteous people who do penance and don't have to. Look what it tells you about God, that God is searching. He's searching, like the shepherd, uh, searching for a lost sheep. He also tells another story. A man had two sons, and the younger of the two sons says to his father, give me my share of the property. Kind of, why wait till you die? A few days later, the younger son gathered all his belongings together and went off to a distant country 
where he lived a reckless life. Use your imagination. Greenwich Village, the Bowery. When his money ran out, the place where he was experienced a severe and terrible famine. So he hired himself out to one of the property classes of the place who put him on his farm to feed the pigs. Now, if you know anything about the Jews, you can't go any lower than feeding the pigs. The pig is unclean, and he longed to fill his belly with the husks that the pigs were eating. But nobody would give him anything. Finally, he came to his senses, and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough to eat, and here am I starving. I will break away. I will return to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And so he set off. The father saw him coming in the distance, and he ran out to him, and he threw his arms around him, and he kissed him. And the son began his little speech. He said, Father, I sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. But the father says, Quick, he said to the servants, Bring in the best robe and put it on him. Forgiveness from top to bottom. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Kill the fatted calf, for we must celebrate because my son was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older brother's out in the field, and he hears the sound of music and dancing, and he calls one of the servants over, and he says to him, what's going on? Or as the black brothers would say, what's happening? He says, your, your brother has come home, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. Well, he won't go in. He won't go in. He attacks his father, and he says, how long have I slaved for you? And you never gave me such a much, so much as a kid goat to celebrate with my friends, but this son of yours, having returned, having wasted your money on loose women, and you killed the fatted calf for him, and the father says, my son, you are with me always. You never understood me either. All that I have is yours. But we had to celebrate because your brother was dead. He has come back to life. He was lost and he is found. We don't know whether the older brother ever, ever went into the party or not, but we do have an insight into what God is like. God so loved the world, God so loved you, that he gave his only son to die in your place for your sins. Let me put it to you this way. If you were the worst sinner in the whole world, the worst sinner, you had committed every possible evil in the whole world, well, Look, you turn to him and your sins are forgiven. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In Burton pastures, he gives me repose. Beside restful waters, he leads me. He refreshes my soul. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil. For you are at my side with your rod and your staff that give me courage. You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. Philip said to Jesus, Show us the Father. Show us what God is like. And Jesus responded by saying, Philip, how long do I have to be with you? Whoever sees me sees the Father. Jesus then is the perfect image 
of the invisible God. So I was very blessed in the home where I grew up that this picture was on display morning, noon, and night. I must have looked at this picture every day of my life, many times a day, uh, for 18 years. Whoever sees me sees the Father. One day, my mother, God rest her soul, said something extraordinary to me. I must have been about five or six at the time, but she says, uh, everything we have, she says, everything we have as Catholics comes to us from the Jews. Now, this is quite a remarkable statement, given the time that it was. It was 1952, six years after uh, World War II, and she's saying everything, everything we have as Catholics comes to us from the Jews. Jesus was Jewish, Mary was Jewish, all of the Twelve Apostles are Jews. In fact, when Jesus was talking to a outcast Samaritan woman at one stage, he said, salvation comes to us from the Jews. We'll take a look now at the Bible. This whole book, the whole scripture, uh, was given to us by God uh, through the Jews. We have the Old Testament, which deals with God's relationship with the Jewish people. And we have the New Testament, which deals with God's relationship with the Jewish people and with the whole world. One of the greatest biblical scholars of all time was a man named Jerome, St. Jerome. And he said this about the Bible, and I kind of love this. He says, the Bible is the most boring book you will ever read. But then he went on to say that the Bible is the most challenging book you will ever study. The Bible is not just a book. It's a library of books. It's the literature of a people. Now, believe it or not, a one-line summary of the Bible is possible. From beginning to end, and I'm speaking now of the Old Testament, the Jewish part of the Bible, it's the story of a broken, adulterous marriage. You have heard, as the whole world has heard, that the Jews are the chosen people. Well, they are, and they still are even at this moment. But chosen for what? The Jews were chosen by God to be the bride of God. But down through their history, they were constantly unfaithful to God, running off, worshipping false gods at different times in their history. So the prophets used to accuse them of being an adulterous generation. So anyway, back to my point. A one-line summary of the Bible is possible. It's the story of a broken, adulterous marriage. I must have been about 19 or 20 at the time when, to my great joy, I discovered the 16th chapter of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel lived at a time when the Jewish people were away from their homeland. They were in Babylon, and they were devastated. They were completely and totally fed up with everything. And so God sends the prophet Ezekiel to address them. Now, this is the part where you'll discover a whole summary of the Bible. The word of God was addressed to Ezekiel the prophet, saying to him, Son of man, confront my people, confront Jerusalem with her filthy crimes. Say, the Lord God says this, by origin and birth, you belong to the land of Cana. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. Ezekiel begins by insulting the Jewish people. He said, you're of mixed blood. It's like somebody saying, your father was Irish, your mother was English. Your father was black, your mother was white. He says, you were nothing. At birth, the very day you were born, there was no one to cut your navel string. 
or wash you in cleansing water, or rub you with salt, or wrap you in napkins. No one lean kindly over you to do anything like that for you. You were exposed in the open fields. You were as unloved as that on the day that you were born. Picture for a moment uh, a little baby just being born and somebody catches the child and flings it out into the desert and leaves it there to die. Well, Ezekiel says to the Jewish people, that's what you were like. Or using one of these frightening modern images, um, a young girl has uh, a baby all by herself in a bathroom someplace and throws the child into a trash can. That's who the Jews were, an abandoned child. But look what happens next, and it is God who is speaking. He said, I saw you struggling in your blood as I was passing, and I said to you as you lay in your blood, live and grow like the grass of the fields. You developed, you grew, you reached marriageable age. Your breasts and your hair both grew, but you were quite naked. Then I saw you as I was passing. Your time had come, the time for love. I spread part of my cloak over you, and I covered your nakedness. I bound myself by oath. I made a marriage covenant with you. It is the Lord God who speaks, and you became mine. I bathed you in water. I washed the blood off you. I anointed you with oil. I gave you embroidered dresses, fine leather shoes, a linen headband and a cloak of silk. I loaded you with jewels. I put a beautiful diadem on your head. You grew more and more beautiful, and you rose to be queen. The fame of your beauty spread through the nations since it was perfect, since I had clothed you with my own splendor. It is the Lord God who speaks. Now, there is the whole Bible in a nutshell. God finds this abandoned girl. She, grow up, she grows up. She's lovely. God marries her. That's who the Jews are, the wife of God. However, listen to what happened next. You became infatuated with your own beauty. You have used your fame to make yourself a prostitute. You have offered your services to all comers. That's who the Jews are. They are the unfaithful wife of God. And you'll find that in the Bible from beginning to end. Just to highlight it in a different way, one of the later prophets in Israel was a man named Hosea. And God said to Hosea, go marry an unfaithful woman. Now, why in the name of God would he say, go marry an unfaithful woman? But anyway, he did what God told him to do. So he married a lady named Gomer, and she was unfaithful, big time, big time. Anyway, she conceived the child, and as soon as the child was born, she took off back onto the streets again. Hosea loved her with a deep love, and he brought her back, kept bringing her back. And she conceived again. And after the child was born, off they go again, back onto the streets. Hosea is heartbroken because he loves her with a tender, tender love. And this goes on and it happens a third time. His wife out on the streets, selling her favors to anybody who was willing to buy them. So finally, the people of the town said to Hosea, Hosea, please, what does all this mean? What, what are you doing? And Hosea said to the people, as my wife treats me, so you treat God. So in both of those stories, then, um, the Jewish people is compared to an adulterous bride. So there had to come a new marriage. And the new marriage took place on the cross of Calvary. Jesus was faithful to God. He was obedient even unto death, 
death upon the cross. In the Temple of Jerusalem, there was the Holy of Holies in the inner sanctuary. And once a year, um, the people of God would assemble in the temple for the Day of Atonement. And the priest would read from the Book of the Law from morning until night, morning until night. And the more he read from the Book of the Law, the more the people realized that they had sinned against God, that they had been unfaithful wives. And so what happened next was two goats were led forward. And over one of the goats, the priest said the sins of the people. That's where the word scapegoat comes from. And then the goat was driven off uh, into the desert. The second goat, its blood was spilt. Now, the punishment for sin was death. So instead of the people dying, the goat died. And the priest would bring the blood in a bowl into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle it on the altar. And in this way, the people were reconciled with God the second time. Well, I want you to look deeply again now at the cross of Calvary. When Jesus, when Jesus was seen first by John the Baptist as an adult, he said, look, he said, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the divine scapegoat. Jesus went out of the city of Jerusalem, weighed down with the sins of the people, freighted down like the Yom Kippur, Kippur goat. But the scripture also says that when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, he cried out at the top of his voice, saying, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And that at that moment, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And Jesus entered not into the Holy of Holies of the Jerusalem temple, but he entered into heaven, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. So on the cross of Calvary then, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ made a new marriage between mankind and God. God, the Father of all mankind, Jesus forever faithful. So if you ever wonder how much you are loved by God, I'd encourage you please to look at the crucifix. If you were the only person in the whole world, Jesus would have done this for you. When he cried out on the cross, I thirst, he was thirsting for you. When he cried out on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, he was praying for you. So, brothers and sisters, it's kind of like this. Um, Jesus, our Lord, gathers the whole human race in his hands, and he stands before the throne of God, and he says, they are with me. So bow your heads now and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with kindness and give you his peace. I bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for watching The Catholic View with Father Patrick J. O'Doherty. If you would like more information about The Catholic View, please call the Queen of Peace Catholic Church at 352-854-2181. If you would like to visit us, we are located at 6455 Southwest State Road 200 in Ocala. We hope you have enjoyed The Catholic View, a program about Catholics for everyone.